melanomas are cancers that arise from melanocytes. And melanocytes are cells that produce melanin pigment. And the melanin absorbs light and protect, protects the tissues from ultraviolet light. So in the eye, you've got the intraocular melanomas arising from a tissue known as the uvea. So they're also known as uveal melanomas. And then you've got the extraocular melanomas on the surface of the eye, which arise from a transparent membrane known as the conjunctiva. So that these are called conjunctival melanomas. Now the interocular uveal melanomas and the conjunctival melanomas are totally distinct from each other and behave in very different ways. The um, interocular melanomas can uh, affect the vision to start off with and if they grow very big they can make the eye inflamed and painful whereas the extraocular conjunctival melanomas can form uh, big lumps on the surface of the eye. And both kinds of melanoma can grow into the tissues behind the eye, and both kinds of melanoma can scatter seeds, can metastasize to the liver and to other parts of the body. So with intraocular melanomas, the, my first choice of treatment is plaque radiotherapy. The plaque is like, is like a 5p coin or a 10p coin that emits radiation. And what we do, we place the plaque behind the eye and stitch it to the wall of the eye next to the tumor. And that gives radiation. Uh, and then after a few days, when the tumor has been sterilized, then the plaque is removed by means of a, a second operation. Now, it's really important to place the plaque precisely in the right place. And uh, I've developed uh, instruments and techniques to position the plaque accurately so that we increase the chances of killing the tumor while reducing the chances of damaging surrounding tissues like optic nerve and so on. If it's not possible to treat safely with a radioactive plaque because of the size of the tumor or the location, then we can treat with proton beam radiotherapy. First, we stitch four tiny markers onto the wall of the eye, behind the, the eye, next to the tumor. And then after one or two weeks, the patient goes to Clatterbridge Cancer Center on the Wirral Peninsula for half a day's planning. And then one or two weeks after that, they go there for four days in a row to receive the radiation treatment. And that kills the tumor. But with radiation treatment, you have damage to the arteries and veins inside the tumor itself. And so the tumor leaks fluid into the retina and under the retina to cause retinal detachment. And the tumor, because it's starved of oxygen, also produces hormones that stimulate the growth of new vessels and new, new arteries and veins. And these can cause high pressure in the eye, glaucoma, which can be painful. And I've called this toxic tumor syndrome. And we can treat this either by giving injections into the eye or laser treatment, or by surgically removing the toxic tumor. If the tumor is too big for radiotherapy and the chances of, of causing harm are, are from the dead tumor are too great, then we remove the eye by means of a small operation. And then we replace the eye with an implant so there isn't a big black hole, there's a little bum. And then we fit an artificial eye that moves and the patient can bl blink over it and so on. And I've done a, a study with colleagues on one and a half thousand patients. And we have found that the quality of life after removal of an eye is about the same as after radiotherapy, all other things being equal. And of course, if the other eye sees well. So that's very encouraging for patients. So the bigger the tumor, the more of the eye that you need to treat, the more of the eye that gets damaged. And so the, the less the chance of conserving vision and the smaller the chance of saving the eye. With regards to survival um, after treatment of intraocular tumors, when I set up the uh, ocular oncology service in Liverpool, I established a, a system for collecting data at the time of treatment and long-term survival data. 
And 4,000 so 4, patients later, my colleagues and I were able to develop a prognostic tool on the internet, which predicts the chances of metastasis in the liver according to the size, location, and extent of the tumor, the microscopic findings, and the genetic mutations in the tumor. And this tumor, this um, prognostic uh, tool has now been validated in, uh, elsewhere and has been shown to be uh, very reliable. The um, chances of uh, predicting survival accurately are greatly improved with, if we know the genetic mutations inside the tumor. And, um, and uh, in Liverpool uh, in 1998, we were the first to provide genetic tumor typing as a routine service to our patients. And now that has become a standard practice in a, in a growing number of centers around the world. And so we can predict the chances of developing tumors in the liver. And that's very important because if there's a high risk of tumors in the liver, then we can target liver scans every few months at patients with the greatest risk so that we can detect tumors more quickly in the liver. And that improves the chances of, of success with treatment. And very recently, Immunocore in Oxfordshire has developed Tebentafast, which, um, which grabs the melanoma cells and grabs the immune killer lymphocytes and brings them together and, and uh, so that the melanoma cells die. And there have been some very exciting uh, uh, results from studies with that new drug. With conjunctival melanomas, we um, predict survival according to the size of the tumor and the location, whether it's on the white of the eye or on the eyelids and so on. Well, with big tumors, it's easy to diagnose for a specialist because they've got a, a big gray, black, brown tumor with uh, fluid under the retina and so on. But with small tumors, it's much more difficult because uh, we need to dif distinguish these malignant, small malignant melanomas from benign nevi, from benign moles. And at the University of Oxford, I developed um, a system for distinguishing benign moles from malignant melanomas. And I did this by de devising the acronym MOLES, which stands for mushroom shape, orange pigment, large size, enlargement, and subretinal fluid, water under the retina. And, uh, and I also devised a scoring system according to the number of these features and the severity of these features. And like this, it is easier for uh, optometrists and ophthalmologists to distinguish benign moles from melanomas. And this system has been validated at Moorfields Eye Hospital and found to be useful when they tried and tested it. And it's now being used more widely. Well, if the mole is very small and uh, with a mole score of zero, then uh, it's managed by, by checkups by the optometrist in the community every two years or every time the patient goes with broken glasses or for another reason. Because uh, moles with a score of zero are very common. About six in a hundred adults has a has a mole like that at the back of the eye. If the mole score is um, one or two, so it's a suspicious mole, uh, low risk or high risk suspicious mole, then the patient should be referred non-urgently to an eye specialist for proper examination using special cameras, different cameras and scans to, to assess um, the size and fluid and orange pigment and so on more precisely. If um, malignant melanoma is suspected if the mole score is more than two, then the patient should be referred urgently to an eye specialist to be seen within two weeks. And then the eye specialist will refer the patient urgently to an ocular oncologist like myself or like a few others 
in London, Liverpool or Sheffield or Glasgow for confirmation of the diagnosis and treatment urgently.